Well, we're returning to the book of Galatians again, and I believe this is the 19th message on the book of Galatians. We'll soon be finished with chapter 5 and leave us with one chapter in the book. I hope the messages have been a blessing to you. I hope you'll even tell me that sometime. It might encourage my heart to know that the messages have been a blessing to you. They've been a tremendous blessing to me, a very special blessing to me. The messages on Galatians have meant something very precious to me. They've opened my eyes to truth that I hadn't received before from the Lord, truth which I'm sure is going to be a future blessing to me too. I hope it's been that way with you. And I hope that as we have come to this practical part in the book of Galatians that these practical truths will get hold of your heart too as the doctrine of the first four chapters are applied. Tonight we're going to deal with the verses 16 through 21. Let us read them together. This I say then, walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And in case I forget it, before we get to that place, the construction of the Greek language in this passage of Scripture indicates that these 17 specific things which are named do not in any ways at all or any means at all exhaust the works of the flesh. These are only 17 of the better known works of the flesh. This is not a complete list of the works of the flesh. And uh, that keeps me from comforting myself if I may try to comfort myself sometime by running hastily over this list of 17 and concluding that I haven't committed any such thing as that. And saying, well, I must not be walking in the flesh. None of these 17 things are being manifest in my life right at this moment. But it doesn't comfort me to say that because the Holy Spirit in the original language of this passage makes it plain that this is only a general summarization of the works of the flesh. These are the better known things that the flesh works in the heart of every man. So in case we forget that, we want to leave that with you tonight. These verses, verse 16 to 21, are actually a comprehensive answer of the Apostle Paul to a question which has not been raised in the text of Galatians thus far, but yet it is always lurking in the background. It is a question which is very uh, plainly stated in the book of Romans, but thus far it has not been stated in the book of Galatians. But it is the question and the proposition that is always raised to the teachings of grace. It is voiced by the apostle in the book of Romans like this. What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? For Paul has been laboring in the doctrine of the Word to show that the law, which was the only restraint man ever had upon him, was done away with. He has argued now for four chapters, in fact, five different and specific illustrations and arguments, he has consistently shown that the believer is not under the law. He is neither under its restraint nor under its curse. He is not under its power. He is not under its voice. The law has absolutely no effect upon the believer whatever. He is under no obligation to it. It is of no concern to him in his relationship to God. 
In fact, it is so completely removed from him by the death of the cross that he himself is said to be dead to the law. For Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. This was his answer to those who tried to place him under the law. He said, I can't be under the law because I'm a dead man. And a dead man can no longer be affected by the law. If you want to know when and how I died to the law, Paul says, it was when the Lord Jesus Christ died. I died with him. And because I was placed in Jesus Christ, he took me down into death at his death, down into burial at his burial, up in resurrection at his resurrection. And when I came forth, I came forth in a newness of life, in a complete different setting, a completely different relationship to God. And since I have been raised in Jesus Christ and seated now in the heavenlies with Christ, I am not under the sphere of the law whatever, and the law has no influence whatever on me. Therefore, cast out the bondwoman and her child. We are born from above. We are of heavenly Jerusalem. We are free people. The law and its sting and its power and its conviction is no longer our lot. Thank God we are under grace. Now, even though, as I say, the proposition is not raised, the answer is given. Because someone would be thinking, but the law was given to restrain man. The law said, Thou shalt not steal, and man knew then that he couldn't steal, or else he'd run into the condemnation of the law. The law said, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Therefore he restrained himself by the power of his law. Now Paul argues the law is gone. Hence the logical conclusion is, all restraint then is gone. If we are then set at liberty, and there is no restraint placed upon us, and since we recognize the fact that the flesh remains the same, in the believer as it is in the unbeliever. What then is going to restrain the believer from doing everything that the flesh would have him do? Won't he just run amok now? Won't he just live an unrestrained life of passion and lust? If the law is taken away as a restraint upon him? If his evil nature is not changed by the new birth? What will restrain him? And Paul answers that Argument, even though, as I said, it was not stated in words by this. This I say then. It is not a law that will restrain you. It is a blessed person now who will restrain you. And this person is the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is a, this is a precious, precious truth. We're on precious ground, too. The believer, far from using his liberty as a, the Greek says, a springboard or a base of operation for sin, for the flesh, this glorious liberty is not misused in the life of the believer because of the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what you think of yourself as a Christian. Maybe you think that you've been a Christian so long that you're far beyond the temptations of the flesh. You're far beyond the power of the flesh. But let me tell you that were it not for the day by day and hour by hour and moment by moment restraint of the Holy Spirit upon you, you would be living a life of unrestrained sin described by these 17 things listed in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. Your heart and my heart, I care not what you think about this or believe about it, God's Word makes it plain that your heart and mine has the same potential that the unsaved heart has. You lust for the same things that the unsaved man lusts for. Your passions are of no different quality than his passions. Your desires are of no different intent than his. But there is the restrainer, thank God, <laughs> And you know, I'd never thought of it until I'd been studying Galatians. I'd never thought of the second Thessalonian letter, the second chapter in connection with this, where the Holy Spirit is definitely spoken of as the one who restrains evil. I'd always thought, I thought of him as restraining evil in the world. And uh, in that second chapter, we are told that he will continue to restrain evil until he be taken out of the way. 
then he will no longer restrain evil, and evil will run amok in this present world. But he will not be taken out of the way until the body of Christ is taken out of the way in the rapture. Just recently, I've been thinking that there's more in that passage than meets the eye. But the Holy Spirit has not only been restraining evil in the world, thank God He's been restraining the evil nature in the body of Christ too. And He's going to do it until it be taken out of the way. And the day He's taken out of the way, He'll not restrain evil anymore in me. What will you do, run amok? No, I won't need His restraint anymore. And the reason I won't need His restraint is because in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, I am to be made like Jesus. Being made like Jesus, I will no longer need the indwelling, restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's the reason the Holy Spirit lives in you? Oh, you thought the Holy Spirit lived in you so He could do good things for you, like give you joy and peace and things like that. Yes, that's part of it. But that's only half His ministry. Just half of it. The first half. And the half that must be performed before the second half can be performed is to restrain in you the passions and lusts of the flesh. Now the Holy Spirit does two things in us. He restrains the old nature, the flesh. He suppresses him. He controls him. And secondly, He produces in us or works in us or makes in us to come into a reality the life of the Lord Jesus Christ described as the fruit of the Spirit. Well, what are we to do? Well, there is something for us to do. Sounds like hard words, doesn't it? Do, yes, do. There's something for us to do. And the Holy Spirit tells us what it is we must do. We must walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. If this was not something the believer could do, he'd never be told by the Holy Spirit to do it. I do not believe that the person of the Holy Spirit is an automatic power that runs by thermostat in our lives. And he just goes into action when he's needed without any response from us. The Bible doesn't teach that. Even though the Bible teaches that we are saved by complete sovereign grace without any works on our part, we also are taught that once we are saved and dwelt of the Holy Spirit, we are put in the place of choice in the matter of walking in the Spirit. We can walk in the Spirit if we will and if we want to. The Lord has taken away Every excuse for sin in the believer's life. We have heard many, many messages on the text. If any man sin, he have an advocate with the Father. Even Christ Jesus the righteous is the propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And that's a precious text, but there's another part to it. It starts out this way. Little children, these things I write unto you that you what? sin not you know we need some preaching on that my little children these things I write unto you that ye sin not it's God's will that ye sin not do you think there's anybody who sins not that's not the point the father desires that we sin not as his little children he has made every provision for us to live and walk in the spirit he has made every provision to live spirit-led, spirit-directed, spirit-controlled lives. He has also made provision, thank God, for the cleansing of sin when we do not walk in the Spirit. But He has taken away every excuse. There's not a single valid excuse in the believer's life for walking in the flesh. Not a single reason can he lay before the throne of God and say, Lord, I didn't want to walk in the flesh, but... I was helpless due to thus and so and thus and so. Every time we walk in the flesh, we are convicted of the Holy Spirit that we have done it willfully. Done it knowing better than to do it. Done it knowing that we have a glorious and victorious alternative to walking in the flesh. And that is walking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says this to believers, This I say then, 
Walk in the Spirit. Order your behavior by the power of the Holy Spirit and not by the flesh. And here is a promise. Ye shall not, ye shall not bring to fulfillment in action the lust of the flesh. Now, <clears throat> this is one of the basic things that the believer needs to learn about the Holy Spirit who indwells him. We've gone over these things many times and we'll repeat them again tonight. First of all, we're not told in the Word that the believer is to wrestle with the flesh. He's not to strive with the flesh. He is not to struggle with the flesh. He is not to fight the flesh. If you have any idea whatever of the nature of the flesh, you'd know what folly it is to wrestle with the flesh. How can a believer defeat him? He's greater than we are, but he is not greater than he that is in us. The Bible teaches plainly that the Spirit must have conflict with the flesh, not us. We are to be passive. We are to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. We are to get in His right away and doing battle with the flesh. We are to yield ourselves unto Him as dead men and give Him the liberty and the right to go ahead with a full-scale war against the flesh who lives within us. And every time we court the flesh, every time we are kind to Him, every time we give Him opportunity, every time we show Him interest, every time we give our influence to Him, we have put the Holy Spirit in defeat, not because the Holy Spirit is not greater than us, but because God has arranged it that way, that the Holy Spirit is in us to give us victory as we yield to Him, as we give ourselves to Him in submission. Notice then in verse 17 where this is plainly stated, for the flesh lusteth against what? Me or the Spirit? All right, the Spirit. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye, here's the third person, ye, ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, when we walk in the flesh... The flesh puts certain desires in our mind and heart. He wants us to do certain things and therefore we want to do them when he's walking in the flesh. When we are walking in the Spirit, the Spirit puts per certain desires in our heart and mind so that we want to do what the Spirit wants to do. And the purpose of this conflict, this lusting one against the other, is that when the Holy Spirit is in control, that we will be restrained in doing that which the flesh wants us to do. And on the other hand, the flesh does conflict against the Spirit in order that He might get control. And if He does, He will keep us from doing that which the Spirit would want us to do. So that we are caught in the middle. It is not we ourselves who fight the flesh. It is the Holy Spirit. And whenever you learn that, you're going to learn a, a step or a key that will unlock many, many battles in your heart. We cannot do battle against the flesh. Give it up. Quit on it. Turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Tell Him that the flesh, you can't cope with Him. It's a thing, it's a heart that you can't cope with. Only you can cope with it, Lord. I submit myself to you. Lord, I can't control my mind today. My mind is in control of the flesh, Lord. And I can't do anything about it. No matter how hard I try to concentrate on the things of the Lord. No matter how hard I get my Bible out and try to read and concentrate on spiritual things, I can't control this mind. Many a time I've sat down to read this book and between every word, I made a round trip around the world in the power of the flesh. Did you ever do that? 
And I'd read a whole page and the page was blank. I'd look back and I'd say, I know I read it, but I don't remember a word on it. I can't control my mind, Lord. You can, but I can't. Lord, I commit my mind to you. I yield my mind to you. Suppress the flesh. Make the mind of Christ operative in me. He does it. He can do it. Lord, I can't control my hands. I can't control my feelings. Lord, I can't control my desires. You can, but I can't. Oh, I submit myself to you, Holy Spirit. Do you ever talk to the Holy Spirit? Well, He's just as real as I am, more so. It's all right to talk to the Holy Spirit. We talk to the Father. We talk to the Lord Jesus. Of course I talk to Him, and He talks with me. <laughs> I talk to the Father, and He talks to me. I pray to the Father, but I also commune with the Lord Jesus. And I commune with the Holy Spirit, for there is such a thing as the fellowship of the Spirit in the believer's life. Can't you just say to Him, Holy Spirit, I know that Thou art in me to suppress the flesh, to restrain Him, to give me victory, to work Your fruit, and to keep me from the desires which He constantly puts in my mind and heart. I can't cope with Him. Will you cope with Him now? He will do it. For this is a part of the victory of the cross. And the Spirit of God is waiting in us. And I bet there's been weeks and weeks and months and months in our lives when we, when we never just so simply ask Him to help us. But instead of saying it, we do give Him this impression. It's all right, Lord, I can take care of this myself. I'll go right ahead. Yes, I know this evil desire is in me. It's okay, Lord. I'll just talk myself out of it now. Couldn't you just simply ask the Holy Spirit, recognizing His person? He'd be delighted if you'd recognize His person. He'd be delighted if you'd turn to Him and treat Him as though He were really resident in you like the Word of God says He is. I think the Holy Spirit would be pleased if the people of God would suddenly recognize the great truth of the Scriptures that He does live in us and that He's here to help us He's here to be to us all that Jesus was to his disciples when he was here, and more so. He's the other comforter. He's here to empower us. He's here to give us victory. He's here to suppress this heart that we can't control. Were it not for that, oh, what our lives would be. So this is what Paul is teaching. Walk in the Spirit. Enlist the Holy Spirit's help. Turn to the Holy Spirit. Beseech, depend on Him, rest in Him. Let Him do in you this which you cannot do yourselves. Let Him do conflict with the flesh. Well, that's His very purpose for indwelling you. First of all, that He might suppress the flesh. And secondly, that He might create in us the fruit of the Spirit, which is truly the life of the Lord Jesus. Now notice the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are antagonistic, the word says. Antagonistic, one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now I want to make this verse very plain because it, it gets twisted around sometimes in our thinking. The flesh is antagonistic against the Spirit. He's opposed to anything the Holy Spirit wants to do. And I told you one time the Lord showed me a very simple test. Sometimes it works. Most all the time it works. Do you know that sometimes when suddenly a thing is presented to me without any premeditation, without any thought beforehand, just suddenly it's presented to me, that I can oftentimes tell just exactly the way my heart instantly reacts as to whether it is the spirit or the flesh behind this thing. Because I've found that when a thing of the spirit is presented to me instantly, the flesh is antagonistic to it. He says, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And when it is a thing of the flesh, the spirit is instantly antagonistic to it. Everything the spirit wants to do in me, the flesh is against it. He will do everything in His power to keep me from doing it. 
He'll work against me. He'll plot against me. He'll plan against me. He'll use friends and neighbors and loved ones against me. He'll use circumstances against me as the devil works through the world to help him accomplish the same thing. The flesh will set himself against anything the Holy Spirit wants to do in me. And I thank God that the Holy Spirit will also set himself against anything the flesh wants to do in me. You know, that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. Because the flesh plots against me. He sets up circumstances when he can with the help of the devil in the world to entice me that the end result might be sin, wicked sin, the sin of walking in the flesh, the works of which are seen here. This is not a, a, a list of sins. This is a list of the works of the one sin of walking in the flesh. You get the difference? These are the works of the one sin of walking in the flesh. Turn over to the book of James and let us look again at those verses in the first chapter. Verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. And this word tempted means to solicit to do evil. Whenever a man is tempted to do evil, when he's solicited to sin, don't ever let him say that God has done this. Because God never solicits a man to do evil. He tempts him in the sense of testing him, trying him. He puts him under the fire. God will do that. But God never solicits a man to do evil. So recognize instantly that when you are tempted to do wrong, this is not a trial of your faith. You hear me now? You know, that's a famous trick of the flesh. Ah, this is a test of my faith now. God's trying my faith by this temptation to evil. Indeed, no. Don't let any man tell you that the solicitation to do evil comes from a God. It does not come from God. It comes from Satan. And it comes from the flesh. Now, how can the devil work on me? The only way he can work on me is through the flesh. He uses the world, for the world is his instrument. He uses the things in the world, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. He uses all of that against me. But he has to work through the flesh, for the flesh is the inside enemy in the Christian life. He is the one that has contact with the soul. Now, notice... Every man, every man is tempted when he, he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. In the original language of this verse 15, or verse 14 and 15, there is a metaphor there is a word picture here that is not given in the English. And I, I think I can give it to you in terms that you will at least get the significance of it. There are two principles involved here, two principal persons. First, he, that's me. He is enticed or he is drawn away. And the second thing which is personified here is lust. Lust is seen here in this word picture as a person. Seen as a person who is trying to entice me. Trying to draw me away. And if I am drawn away by this person called lust, and give myself to this person, yield myself to him, there will be conception. And that which will be born to me in lust will be sin. And this sin, when it grows up, the word picture goes on, will present me with death. Now, in the words drawn away and enticed, we have a little idea of how lust works in us. It's an interesting thing. These are both hunting and fishing metaphors. The word enticed, or drawn away, for instance, means to lure uh, an animal out of its safe hiding place. 
like a rabbit that's back in his hole, and you lure him out, you trick him out of his hole so that you can trap him, so you can kill him. That's the word that's used here. And uh, the word enticed is a fishing metaphor. It means to, to lure a fish with bait on a hook. Now here's the picture. Lust, the lust of the flesh. The flesh is lusting in us constantly. Lust is an evil desire. It's an evil passion. It's an unlawful passion, an unlawful desire. And in my flesh there are certain unlawful desires for me as a believer. These lusts, are trying constantly to draw me out of my hiding place. Do you believe that? Do you know where my hiding place is? In the Spirit. Every time I'm walking in the Spirit, the flesh is busy trying to draw me out of my hiding place. Every time I'm walking in the Spirit, the flesh is at work laying his traps for me, trying to lure me out from the safety of the Spirit's walk, that I might be enticed, I might give myself over to Him, and hence giving myself over to Him, reap the harvest of sin, as James so graphically describes. The Holy Spirit will keep us from His traps if we will walk in the Spirit, if we will give ourselves to the Holy Spirit, if we will recognize that we can't do combat with the, with the flesh and win if we will realize that only the Holy Spirit can be victorious in us and not we ourselves. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, Galatians 5.17, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are antagonistic, the one to the other. And the purpose of their lusting, their conflict against each other is this, to keep you from doing what you would do under the influence of the other one. In other words, the flesh is at work to keep you from doing what you would do if the Spirit were in control. The Spirit is lusting against the flesh to keep you from doing what you would do if the flesh were in control. And that is the conflict that goes on constantly down inside. And even though I've told this story to you a dozen times, more or less, I tell it to you again. The little Indian boy uh, who told what went on down in his heart after he was saved. He said, there's a white dog and a black dog, and they fight all the time. And the man asked him, who wins? And he said, the one I feed the most. The one I feed the most. It's a painful thought for a believer. Oh, what a painful thought it is to me. What conviction it brings on my heart. How much have you fed the flesh today? And how much have you fed the Holy Spirit? He didn't know how to say it, like Paul says it. Had he said it like Paul, he would have said, The one to whom I yield myself. The one to whom I give myself. The one I minister to by giving myself to. That's the one who wins in me. And every time the flesh wins in you, it's because you've helped him win. Every time the flesh wins, it's because you fed him. Every time the flesh wins, it's because you yielded to him. You assisted him. You gave him the help he needed to get victory. And every time the Holy Spirit wins, it's by your yielding yourself to him. Now the works of the flesh are well known. The word manifest in this verse means, it means they're clearly defined. <laughs> Nobody needs guess what the works of the flesh are. Maybe you're saying, well, I don't know whether I walk in the flesh or not. Oh, don't be so naive. The, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you in a minute what the works of the flesh are, just some of them. So if none of these things describe anything in you, don't feel comforted. The Holy Spirit makes it plain this is a general list of the works of the flesh, not a complete and exhaustive list. The works of the flesh are made plain. They're made plain. They're clearly defined. And brother, when these things are made known in your life and in your heart, you rest assured it's because you've been walking in the flesh. No other reason. There is no justification in the Christian life for any of these things. You may have been successful... <laughs> in learning how to yield to the Holy Spirit in the matter of adultery. 
I imagine that believers have, for they learn that early. Some of these grosser sins, grosser, I'm using now the words of man, not of God, but some of these grosser sins of the flesh are first and early dealt with in the Christian life. The grace of God in Titus 2, we are told, teaches us how to deny ungodliness. So the first thing he does is go right to work with his teaching ministry, lusting against the flesh and teaching us early in our Christian life how to abstain from these grosser things of the flesh listed like adultery and fornication. And yet what about the adultery that Jesus spoke of? The adultery of the heart. Fornication of the heart. And remember that the mind is just as much a member of our bodies as the members, our physical members of our bodies are. What is the difference between giving the physical members of our body to adultery or giving our minds to it? And if you've given your mind to these things, it's because you've given yourself to the power of the flesh. The Holy Spirit can and the Holy Spirit will suppress even the thoughts of the mind if the mind is yielded to it just as our hands, our feet, our ears, our eyes, our tongue are yielded to it. Now notice. The works of the flesh are made plain. Which are these? And that's the phrase, if you're interested in knowing where I got the idea that this was only a, a limited list. Which are these? Look it up in your concordance and see what it says. It says, I will list a few, but not an exhaustive list. Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. And the word lasciviousness in this context means without restraint. It's kind of a capriciousness. It's kind of a just doing whatever comes in our mind to do. Just doing anything we feel like doing. Anytime we feel like doing it. And if it conflicts with something the Holy Spirit wants us to do, well, we just do it anyway. A lack of restraint and a lack of discipline in that which we do, those places we go, the things we engage in. And believe me, and, and you know it's hard to preach on passages of Scripture like this because it seems like you're, you're uh, kind of just preaching at everybody you know, plus yourself. It seems like you're just picking out people's sins and preaching on them. But you know, I've seen this thing so much in believers' lives. Free from adultery, yes. The, the, the flesh doesn't manifest all the same works in every believer's life, you see. In one believer's life, it may be this work or that work or these works or these works. And in your life, it may be something else. But I've seen this work of the flesh. This capriciousness that I speak of. This just... Do whatever comes naturally. Just do what I feel like doing. If I feel like going fishing today, even though I know I ought to be in the assembly, I just go fishing because I feel led to go fishing. I have peace about it. I feel like not going to work today because I just don't feel like going to work today. Or I, I feel like doing this and so I'll just do it. It's kind of a just a, an irresponsibility, a spiritual irresponsibility that just makes a man to go from pillar to post doing whatever he wants to do, anytime he wants to do it, with anybody he wants to do it with. No restraint and no discipline, apparently, upon his life. This is one of the manifestations of a fleshly walk in the Christian's life. Now, we have idolatry, which is always one of the works of the flesh, turning turning the heart to the worship of something or someone other than God needs not too much comment, does it? Even to the worship of ourselves. And you know, I've been amazed. I don't like to bring this up too often because it gets on people's nerves to hear about it. But uh, I've been amazed at how many times we believe the lying tongue of our flesh. He just lies to us 90 miles an hour. We believe Him. 
And what's strange is that we go out and tell other people about it too, about how he lied to us and we believed him. We don't say it in that word. In other words, we say, uh, uh, say, uh, missed you the other day when down to the assembly. Yeah, I didn't feel like going. Who told you you didn't feel like going? I don't know. Maybe the Lord told you you didn't feel like going. I'm not talking about when you were sick in bed, you couldn't go. I'm talking about when you didn't feel like coming. You had a tummy ache or you had a headache or you had a back ache or a foot ache or something. Now, you just didn't feel like coming. Somehow, I just didn't feel right about going to the assembly today or tonight. And you felt like maybe you'd do better if you just stayed home, you felt like. Well, who gave you all these wonderful feelings that you had that decided all of these wonderful things in your mind? against the clear command of the Word of God to forsake not the assembly of yourselves together after the manner of some is. Why, the flesh gave them to you, of course. He'll make you feel so bad you never will come to the assembly again if you let Him. He'll make you feel so bad you never will read your Bible or you never will pray or you never will witness or you never will do anything else that the Spirit wants to do in you and wants to do through you. Because all you do is listen to Him. Why don't you listen to the Holy Spirit? This is really what Paul says when he says, walk in the Spirit. He says, listen to the Holy Spirit. Obey Him. He'll tell you what to do. And He'll not only tell you what to do, thank God, He'll empower you to do it. His callings are His enablements. Well, we don't feel like doing something, so we don't do it. This is the open manifestation of a life that's controlled by the flesh. What a grievance it is to the Lord. And the sad part is how it robs you of your joy and your peace. <laughs> I'll tell you, you're going to learn something when you come to a place where you just say, all right, so I don't feel like God. But I need to go. I must go. And Holy Spirit, you enable me and I will go. Of course I don't feel like it. I haven't felt like going to Elizabeth for the last three weeks. I just confess my sins to Brother Bob and some of them have been out to me. I haven't felt like it for three weeks. In the last three Tuesday nights, I've sworn up and down in my heart I wouldn't go. I didn't feel like it. And I kept saying, I just don't feel like going. I feel bad. My head hurts. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> born tired and never got rested. I'm just worn out. What good would it do me to go? Boy, the flesh likes to talk that way, doesn't it? Do better just to stay home and rest up. And each time, the only way I got to Elizabeth, and I'll tell you by the glory of God, the only way I got to Elizabeth was by the works of this passage of Scripture was by just saying to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I can't get to Elizabeth tonight. If I get to Elizabeth, you're going to have to get me there. I can't go. Give me a desire to go. Take over in my mind and in my heart, in my hands. Give me the desire to go and give me the strength and the enablement to go. And he's done it. And he will do it. I'm not saying there's... But there's never a time when you can't go. There's times when you can't go. And the Holy Spirit will make that just as plain to you as He will the times when you ought to get up and go instead of listening to the flesh belly ache around about how tired you feel. I said people don't like to hear these things, but they're true things. You know they are. My, if you knew tonight how many times the flesh has robbed you of a blessing by lying to you about what you could do and what you couldn't do. You believed him, hook, line, and sinker. You sat right there and said, anything you say, place is all right with me. I agree with you. I agree with you. But the first suggestion, I don't feel like going tonight. Why do we always readily say, that's the truth? I don't. When we say, who said so? Who are you to be telling me how I feel? <laughs> I guess I can go if I want to go. Or I guess I can do this if I want to. If it's the Holy Spirit's desire, if it's God's will, I can do it. And I must do it. And I shall do it. For the glory of God. You'd be surprised the things you can do when you think you can't do it. So, these are some of the manifestations. Not only an unrestraint in our life, but idolatry. Worshipping ourselves. And that 
last little discourse might come under that list too. Worshiping ourselves. Our wants and our wishes and our desires. What we long for instead of what the Holy Spirit wants. The next word is witchcraft. And although it comes from the root, which means to use drugs, it also infers turning to sorcery. The fortune tellers. Do you, do you uh, work out the daily uh, astrology problems in the paper to see how you're going to fare today? Or do you resort to the witch of vendor? Just what means do you use <laughs> to find out? Do you like to get weighed on the scales to see what your fortune is? I did that the other day. It cost me a whole penny. It says you're going to fall in love. <laughs> I wish I had my penny back. <laughs> a terrible fortune. Witchcraft. And I think that also includes, and I don't want to touch on this too much for fear you'll think I'm preaching against or for something. I'm not either for or against anything. But I do warn you that the root of this word is the use of drugs. And I believe with all of my heart, like it or not, I don't like it. This is one word I don't like. I believe one of the flesh's works and one of his tricks is to get the believer to rely on drugs many times when he ought to be relying on the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not preaching against drugs, mind you. I'm not preaching for them. I'm just preaching that when you use them, make sure you use them by the permission and by the peace of the Holy Spirit just like you would use anything else in your life by the peace and the authority and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. you follow me? It's a lot easier sometimes to take a tranquilizer than it is to suffer a little bit. A lot easier to, to gulp down a bottle of pills than it is to let the Lord deal with us in our bodies sometimes as it's necessary for Him to do. So be careful that the flesh doesn't fool you with this matter of witchcraft. It's one of His works. It's one of his works, and I think he oftentimes uses it to a great advantage in turning the believer to drugs when the believer ought to be turning to the Holy Spirit. Hatred. This is the word in the Greek language which is the direct opposite of love. Think of everything you feel when you're supposed to love, and this is the opposite of it, hatred. The bitterness and the enmity that the flesh works in our hearts against others. This is one of his works. And he'll work that in your heart every time you yield to him. And if you have bitterness in your heart tonight, if you have enmity in your heart tonight towards anybody, I don't care whether it's your enemies or your friends, I don't care whether it's your brother in Christ or your unsaved neighbor, it's because you've yielded to the Holy Spirit and allowed him, or yielded to the flesh and allowed him to work that in your heart against that person. And, and you can be rid of it tonight. You could be rid of it by submitting to the Holy Spirit and asking Him to take that bitterness away toward that person and take that enmity and that hatred away. And He'd take it away. It's a work of the flesh. He'd be tickled to death to remove it for you and banish it from your heart. But you won't relinquish it. You like it. <laughs> I'll never forgive that fellow. I'll never forget what he did to me. You like to nurse it because that genders self-pity. You like to get this old sore out and lick it because that exalts you and it debases him. It's the work of the flesh. It's one of his tricks. One of his snares robs you of the Spirit's walk and the Spirit's joy. I don't mean by that that you have to love that man's ways nor cooperate with them nor be a party to them. You don't have to have that bitterness in your heart toward him either. The Holy Spirit will take that away. But you won't let him have it. That's the reason he doesn't remove it. You don't want him to have it. You enjoy it. It exalts you. It debases him. It proves you're right and proves he's wrong. You're not about to yield that to the Holy Spirit because that profits you. Then there is the word variance. Variance. Being at odds comes almost under the same category. Striving against someone else. 
the word emulation. The only way I've ever found to describe this word is to say that it is an unholy keeping up with the Joneses. Emulation. Being envious in our hearts of what another has and trying to get the same thing or something better. It may be material things, which is only incidental. Maybe spiritual things. Maybe something else. Maybe reputation. Maybe character. Maybe name or fame or something else. But it's envious of something that someone else has and a desire to have as much or more. We'll show that person. That's emulation, and it's one of the works of the flesh. <laughs> well, the common ways it works is when you're driving down the highway and somebody roars by in passing gear and blows uh, oil smoke in your face, and the flesh says, he can't do that to me, me sitting here on 260 horsepower. Zoom! I'll show him a thing or two. Then you pass him as your car is rocking and careening down the highway at 80 miles an hour. You look over and... Emulation smiling all over your face. You say, you got a Buick, I got an Oldsmobile. You got an Oldsmobile, I got a Buick. <laughs> that is one of the ways that the flesh likes to emulate the world. And then not only emulation, but there is wrath boiling up in hot anger in our hearts against another. It may only be momentary. It may only be for a second. It may be for an hour or a day. But there is this thing which is called wrath. It boils up in the heart. And the flesh will let it boil up if you let him let it boil up. How easy it might be to turn to the Holy Spirit when something has happened to work wrath in your heart. And things will happen, believe me, to work wrath in your heart. How easy to turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to get mad if you don't do something. How easy for him to say with the sweet voice of the Lord Jesus in view of Calvary and in view of who you are and what you are in the family of God. What does it matter what this man has done to you or what he has said or what has happened of how little consequence it is compared to eternity? How easy that white hot anger which boils up into wrath and be quenched by the Holy Spirit if we would let him. How easy. Then there is strife. And this is a word which comes from a root which means labor for hire. It's a strange word. I was looking it up and running it down at the same time. And here's what I found the word means. It means to, to hold an official position for pay, then to use your influence to further yourself. Even if you have to sow discord and strife among the people you work for. That just sounds like some people operate on their jobs, doesn't it? You're hired out for pay, and you're using that position to further yourself, or to exalt yourself, or to profit yourself, even if you have to sow discord and strife among the other employees to do it. You ever work with anybody like that? Wasn't well, you, was it? I think this is a characteristic of the ministry, don't you? Sure does describe the ministry. An official who is hired, and even though he has to sow discord and strife among his employers, for he has multiple employers, he's going to exalt himself no matter what he does. This is a word which is translated here as strife. Self-seeking is a simple definition of it. Self-seeking. It's called me first. Me first at everybody else's expense. Whether it's on the job, in the family, getting the first and the biggest piece of meat on the plate like I do, or the last piece of candy in the dish, or whatever it is, it's self-seeking. It's one of the works of the flesh. It never says... I came not to minister, be ministered unto, but to minister. It always says, I came to, min to be ministered to, not minister. Self-seeking. And then the word envies, which is self-explanatory, just that wicked heart that envies everything and everybody else. Boy, if I had what he had, I'd do thus and so. Or if I were just in his circumstances, 
Why is it that he has this and I don't? Well, I wish I could trade places with him. And so forth. One of the works of the flesh. Murder. Well, thank God the Holy Spirit's restrained me from killing anybody recently. But I do have trouble about hating my brother sometimes. You probably don't have that trouble, but I want to tell you that if we don't watch our hearts and walk in the Spirit, we'll end up hating our brother. Even our brothers who are washed in the same blood we're washed in, we'll hate them if we're not careful. Oh, we say we don't. <laughs> We say, oh, I don't hate him. I just don't like him. Well, you use whatever terms you want to. Be careful it isn't hatred. You wouldn't kill him. You wouldn't take a knife and cut his throat or a gun and shoot him. <laughs> but you'd knife him in the back with your tongue if you got a chance. What's the difference? There isn't any different kind of hatred. It's all one branch. <coughs> It doesn't make any difference whether you use the tongue as a knife or whether you use a knife of steel. If your object is to destroy that brother, even if you're only out to destroy him in the eyes of another believer or destroy him in the eyes of a group of believers, you're murdering him, you're slaying him because of something that's not right in your heart against him. It's the work of the flesh. It's manifest. It's made clear and plain. Everybody knows it's the work of the flesh. It doesn't have to be that way. The Holy Spirit would give you victory over it. If you'd confess it as sin, recognize it as sin, and turn to the Holy Spirit for help. And then there is drunkenness and revelings, which is uh, drunken parties. Giving ourselves over to excess may not be with whiskey might be at the table <laughs> just might be in something that we like to do real well but giving ourselves over to excess and Paul warns and I hope you'll hear this warning <coughs> the word do means to habitually practice and Paul warns that if there's any man among us tonight who habitually practices these things that these things are characteristic and descriptive of his life. He's not a saved man. He's an unsaved man who will under no circumstances inherit the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you, Christians look upon this passage in Galatians as one of those passages where they read over very quickly and very lightly and they scan the list and say, Nope, none of these things in my life. Christians find it hard to even confess that they walk in the flesh from time to time. And yet there are many professing Christians whose lives are characterized by one or more of these 17 things. They habitually practice them, not once in a while, not falling into them when they're not walking in the Spirit, but habitually walking in them, habitually walking under the power of them. And Paul says, I want to tell you, as I told you one other time before, I told you in times past, he said, I want to tell you one more time that if you habitually practice these things, it's a sign you've never been saved. Do you know why? Because it shows that there has been absolutely no restraint whatever of the Holy Spirit at work in you. It isn't possible for a man to be saved and never walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is his rule of life. He consistently walks in the Spirit. His walking in the flesh are his spasmodic experiences in the Christian life. The rule of his life is to walk in the Spirit. He strives to walk in the Spirit. He desires to walk in the Spirit. He longs to walk in the Spirit. He weeps over this walk in the Spirit before the Lord. It is the ambition, if you want to put it that way, the goal of his life. It's the thing his heart yearns for. He's watching in his life that he might walk in the Spirit more than he has in the past. 
And I'm just, I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe it's a therapy thing and it's just stirring up mine. I'm not sure walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit are the same thing. I'm wondering if walking in the Spirit isn't a part of being filled with the Spirit. I can't elaborate on it. But to be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit is submit to Him in these things as Paul brings them out here tonight. But there are also those who profess to be saved whose lives are marked by the habitual conduct that's described here. They may not live in adultery and fornication. They may not live in drunkenness and wild parties. But they live week after week in hatred and envy and strife and variance. In their own deceived hearts and minds, they suppose this to be a temporary condition which will pass away soon. That they could just have the clarity of thought to sit down and analyze the past. They would realize that they have gone from one set of circumstances to another, but the works that were manifest in their life have been the same through every set of circumstances. And I tell you, like the Apostle Paul, that they who habitually practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, for they are not Christ at all. They show no sign of having the restraining work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Our Father, we thank you tonight for this work of the Holy Spirit in us. This blessed person who lives in us, who will, as we yield to him, give us victory in no matter what era of our lives we need victory in. No matter what it is, Father, we have mentioned these things because Thou hast spoken in Thy Word about them. This is 50% of the Spirit's ministry is to restrain the flesh from working these things in our hearts. And He does that just as we yield to Him and just as we submit to Him. And then, Father, when He is restraining the flesh, we're not just filled with a vacuum when he is restraining the flesh in us, he is manifesting the fruit of the Spirit or the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of these things which we have named, there is the love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the goodness and the long-suffering and the patience and all that goes into the life of the Lord Jesus seen in us. Oh, it may be imperfectly seen, we agree, but yet it is seen, Father thank God it is seen and we have seen the fruit of the Spirit in many believers lives how we thank you Father this is a truth which works a practical truth blessed to our hearts and for thy glory in Jesus name Amen Lord bless you